everybody, it's Richardson here with a, another ASR Miniature Art review of a grand tournament or convention. Today we're going to be going over the Lone Wolf GT 2024 Grand Tournament for Kings of War. Um, it's an event held down in Dallas-Fort Worth area, Texas uh, by the tournament organizer Mark Cox, who's a fantastic guy. I love seeing Mark at every chance I get to. Um, and it's pro I think it's, it's without a doubt one of the largest Grand Tournaments for Kings of War in the States every year. Um, and honestly, I've been going, I think, every year for the entire time I've been playing the game, and it's one of my favorite events, for sure. It's a really good time. Mark does a really good job of putting on a good show. Uh, a lot of people are just getting together, having drinks, having fun, playing games, rolling dice. Um, so, but first, let's, before we get into, like, you know, my review of it all and, and, and how my games went, I just want to remind you all again that this is to help you kind of choose if this is an event that you would like to go to. Um... And I also want to kind of tell you what the event is uh, as a whole before we really get into the nitty gritty. So what what about Lone Wolf is unique outside of the fact that it's just a you know what makes it Lone Wolf outside of just a grand tournament, a big a big tournament for Kings of War. Well, I would say that there's there's really two things that make Lone Wolf stand out um, as a unique experience, a unique event. Um, the first one being that the missions are different than just your run of the mill book missions. Um, they're very unique to this, this specific tournament. Uh, and then also the event characters. There's a ranger and a lone wolf. A lone ranger and a lone wolf. Um, let's talk about the missions a little bit first. So the missions are missions from the core book, but with a lot of tweaking done to them. Um, most obviously, a lot of them have progressive scoring starting on turn three. So instead of like your traditional Kings of War mission, like let's say Invade, um, where Actually, that's a bad example. So, like, let's say Pillage, where you're controlling the objectives, and at the end of the game, you score one time to turn, you know, to determine who controls what objectives, and that's how many points you get. Um, these missions will score starting turn three, whatever missions, whatever objectives you control, you get points. Turn four, you, whatever you control, you get points. So, there's an opportunity to start behind and then get ahead, or to lose a lead, um, rather than just the dice falling where they are at the very end of the last round. Um, I actually really like that. I think it's, it's unique, and I think it provides um, a better understanding of the flow of, the, of, the, of how the game could go. There will be times where you'll lose the last round of a game, and it'll be like a blowout, but it's a lot closer of a game than it actually looks. Uh, I really do like that. And so, and, and by the way, again, I'm, I'll mention again that these basically are uh, core rulebook missions, but with some tweaking done. Uh, I'm going to call them by the core rulebook missions uh, when I go over them in my games later. That's not what they were actually called. I'll try to remember their fun event name when I can, but I don't remember them entirely. Um, they're, they are uh, lost to my memory, but I do know what they are from a core book standpoint, so just bear with me there. The other thing that they do is they have special bonuses. So that could range from, and I, and I don't remember them all, so I'll apologize in advance for that, but they'll range from something like, okay, whoever has the most inspiring units left on the battlefield gets an extra two points or after all scoring is done, and stuff like that. Or like, if you controlled the secret objective that you wrote down at the start of the game, you know, you picked one of the objectives on the table to be your secret objective, and if you picked that one and you control it at the end of the game, you get an extra, like, two or three points or whatever, right? And so that's kind of the idea behind the missions. And it's very fun. It's very it's very dynamic. It's very fun. It's very, um, very unique. Um, and I think it provides a good experience for both new and old players. For people who just want to go and have fun, the missions are fun and crazy, and they do some wild stuff, and they allow people to just go and relax and have a good time playing goofy missions. I don't typically take this tournament very seriously because it's a really competitive field. Texas has some of the best players, I think, in Kings of War, uh, and it's hard to compete in that field. So for some people, that might be a turnoff, being like, oh, I don't want to go compete with them. But it's actually quite the opposite. It's big enough of a field that you'll get paired up against people that are at your skill level, after round one or two. And then the missions are just really fun that you're gonna enjoy the game, kind of whatever's going on. Like, oh man, like one of the missions is like you roll, each player rolls like 3d6 dice, adds them together, and that's how far you can see. And you need like line of sight for Kings of War for charges. So it's like, oh, I could only, we, we rolled and we got 10 inches. Well, I can't charge my dragon that flies 20 inches now because we can't see that far, it's called a blizzard. Um, and so there's fun stuff like that. And so, but then as a competitive player, you have to really challenge yourself to bring a diverse list to handle these kinds of missions. 
And you also have to know how to pilot it in the middle of the game that anything can happen. So it's really fun. And I think the missions add a lot of character and joy to this tournament. Um, the other thing is the Lone Wolf and the Lone Ranger. Uh, the Lone Ranger is usually... I, I don't want to... I don't know them too well. Like, I, I don't remember the details. I played with the Lone Wolf myself in my Empire Dust army um, that I brought. The Ranger was basically like five shots, I think, with Elite hitting on threes and piercing two. Just a really good individual that shoots well. Nothing really extra to him. Uh, and then the Lone Wolf was a height two cavalry that had like six attacks, hit on threes, uh, and like crush one thunder one with vicious. So just both, both really good. And I think uh, the, the Ranger had shattering and the Wolf had dread. Um, and they had some once per game abilities that were unique to them. Like the Wolf, I know this is the only one I ever used. I don't remember all of the unique abilities they had available. But the Wolf specifically could do dread two or Sir, uh, cloak of death. And I chose cloak of death almost every single game. So it's a, you know, they get that ability once per game on the start of a round. Uh, and they're very unique. They're very unique. I know a lot of events do characters, uh, but I've not seen characters that were themed this way. Um, and I really do like that they give you a choice of two. I know Bug Eater also does typically a choice. Uh, I think that's the best way to do it. Um, don't just do one stock option or one for each alignment. I like just, here's two characters that do different things. Pick which one you think is cool. Uh, and there's a lot of really fun hobbying opportunities um, with a Lone Ranger and a Lone Wolf. So I took a wolf model that was um, like uh, one of my buddy Dave's. One of my buddies Dave printed it for me. It's like the, the wolf with the sword in its mouth, and it was just a cool looking model. So I had a lot of fun with that. I always have fun with these abandonments. And so that that's those are the things that kind of make Lone Wolf what it is. Uh, really, it's a lot of it. A lot of it is the missions, though, and and the atmosphere too. The atmosphere is really awesome. If everybody's just drinking is a focus almost uh, at this event. Uh, everybody's drinking. There's actually a fun award that's given out for the person who basically drank the most uh, or who maybe had the highest bar tab or something like that, right? It's a little different every year, but just somebody who stood out as a drinker. So it was a lot of fun. Um, who all went to this event that... Uh, from my group, we had the Sons of Drew, which is our local team. We had Aaron and Noah, Kyle, Dave, and Ethan go with me. And then we had our sister group, OK Crew, which had Bill Tucker and Mark go. Um, so we had nine Okies go, which is pretty good. I think it was 57 people at the event. So, you know, we were a little over 10% of the field, which is cool. It was a lot of fun getting to have a, a nice big presence there for um, Oklahoma. And... Honestly, uh, this is the first event the out of state that the Sons of Drew have gotten to go to, and I think we really bonded well over this event. We had a really good time. I don't think anybody, I mean, there were some, you know, some people like, oh man, it sucked. I didn't do so well, but I think everybody had fun, and and I and I see that already from the, the the trip home, and then also the discussion here the day after. This is I'm recording this on the Monday after the event. Um, People are already talking about list and the next event they want to go to. They want to check out Bug Eater GT, which we'll be doing a review of that because I'm if work work allows me, I'll be doing a, a review uh, when I go to that event in June. Um, and yeah, it's just I think the the group is really excited, and I was happy to get to go with them, and we had a, a really good time. Um, so that's Lone Wolf. That's Lone Wolf. That's who all went with me. Um, really, the only thing left to talk about is the games, and of course, as we go through this whole thing. I'll be putting pictures up and stuff and of my games and of pictures of the group and of the event itself. I have, I think, a photo of the prize wall. We got a ton of prize support that was there. Um, and the uh, the games I had that I played, I played five games this weekend, uh, and I'll just get cut to the chase here. I, I went one and four with my Empire Dust, which is not too much better than I did uh, at Adepticon. I think technically I went two, three at Adepticon, but um, one of the games I won was against a guy who was brand new. And I, it's, it's really hard to have any kind of merit to that for myself. Uh, Empire Dust is proving to be a very difficult army for me. Uh, I'm not getting, I'm not, I'm not learning it as quick as I thought I would or, or really um, acquiring the skills that I need to, to perform with that army like I, I need to. But that's okay. Um, you know, I'm going to keep trying it. And I like the army's aesthetic. I like playing the army. Uh, I'm going to try and just keep improving on it and go from there. But... Um, the list I brought was a 2300 point um, list with the Lone Wolf as well, in addition to that. Uh, and it was two spearmen regiments, one warrior horde, 
two regiments of mummies, two hordes of enslaved guardians, and one had Sir Jesse's boots of striding, um, the monolith, the sultanair, Chovic, idol Chovic, an undead worm, two units of scavengers, a desert swarm, Sevic Rye, and I think that was it. I think, said, I think that was all of it. So um, only one magic item, but EOD is really good about just having good stock units regardless of magic items. But that's what I ended up bringing. Uh, I ended up going 1-4. Um, but going into the games, we had game one was against a, a dear friend of mine, Brian Ching, who uh, used to live in Oklahoma, and I used to play a lot of games with him, and he's a fantastic guy. I really love Brian. Uh, but he moved to Dallas, uh, and so he actually came to the event for the first day and, and challenged me, so that way we could make sure we got a game in, and I was really happy about that, because uh, I haven't got to play with Brian, or really even talk to him in, in quite a while, and it was really fun getting to reconnect with him and have a, have a blast, and we had a really fun game. He was playing his Abyssal Dwarf um, list, which is a bunch of uh, half-breed champions and half-breed regiments, so it's actually quite fast for an Abyssal Dwarf army. Uh, and he had some Insidian Golems and Decimators in there. And we had a pretty close game. Um, the scenario was Kill, um, which I have to say this is the first GT that I've, I've ever played that Kill was an option that I can recall. It's typically not one that, that events run, and I prefer it actually to be one that events don't run. I don't think it's a very fun uh, experience, and nor does it represent the game well. Because some armies do just kill better than others. Um, but anyways, I digress. The, the game was, was actually pretty fun. Um, it came down to, uh, at the very end of the game, I had an Enslaved Guardian Horde and Shobik and Sepik Rai left. And he had an entire Decimator Horde and Bazuzu and an, a Half-Breed Champion and another Hero. It was something like a difference of 300 points. Um, so it was a very low scoring win for Brian. And I had a last ditch effort to try and kill a Decimator Horde, but wasn't able to do it. Um, my units were just too far out of place, and I couldn't get any surges going to get any additional charges in on the last turn. I think we went to a turn seven. Um, and it just did not work out for me. Uh, and then something else that I just remembered that uh, is, it wasn't prevalent in this game, but it is something else that makes Lone Wolf kind of unique. Uh, is they do have a tournament reroll. If you buy the Lone Wolf dice at the event, you do get a free reroll of a single die um, every game, once every game. So that's something that, that is, I like that rule a lot because there's some times where you get a really crappy double ones or you can actually use it on the turn seven roll if you're the person rolling the, the, the turn seven roll. Uh, it's just a fun way for them to, you know, be able to afford some extra trinkets and dice and stuff that are fun. And we get rewarded for it in our games. So, but Brian ended up getting me. Um, it was it was a it was a bloodbath. We had a very close game. I mean, we, we like I said, we had like a difference of like 300 points or so. It was a very uh, low win for him. Which, if if you don't know, Kings of War, uh, it's all about points. So, both players uh, scores equal 20. So, if you win, like a standard win is like usually I think 13 seven. So the winner would get 13 points, and the loser would get seven points. Uh, if you completely just wipe your opponent, it's a 20 point to zero. A draw is 10-10. Um, and I think Brian and I had like a 13-7 game. It was pretty pretty close, uh, or like a 12-8 game, something like that. It was, it was a very low scoring win and a high scoring loss, which that's what you want. Because uh, Kings of War is not about win loss, it's about your total points. So you can afford a loss usually, if it's a good loss. Like if it's like a nine or eight point loss, that's a good loss. Um, so, anyways, that was Brian and I's game. It was very fun. Um, we had some pretty pretty thematic moments of uh, Skeleton Spearmen uh, just really holding the line against, uh, against all these cavalry he brought. Uh, and then the only thing that really just went poorly for me is I sent my Lone Wolf into his, and I tried to get the to kill his wolf, and he got a really solid nerve roll to kill mine back after, like, a turn of us both fighting each other. Uh, and then that just kind of let him command one of the flanks because uh, the lone wolf is the lone wolf having dread and being an extra basically like two or three wounds into any of the combats is is huge. It's a big deal. So uh, plus the cloak of death turn as well if you do that. So it's basically dread, dread plus an extra free damage plus the two or three damage it's going to do itself. But that adds up. That's a five a five damage quote unquote swing. So um, yeah. So anyways, so then game two I played against Paul Welsh. 
Uh, and I'm going to just say right now, I don't know everybody's last names. I'm going to try and remember the best I can. Uh, I think I do, but um, Paul Welsh was actually, I believe, the guest that Lone Wolf, man, this, I'm just remembering stuff all the time. Lone Wolf has another thing that's really cool about it is they invite a uh, international guest to come, and I think they even pay for them to get over and stay. So this year it was Paul Welsh uh, from the UK, uh, and Paul, if you see this and you're not from the UK, I'm sorry, but I thought you, I think you are. You talk British, so I'm going to assume that that's the case. So <laughs> typical American, uh, and I believe he came with a friend of his that I did not get the name of, but uh, those two came over, and I got to play Paul and his Night Stalkers round two in Pillage. And I think this one's fun scenario was like the oil well or something like that, um, or or oil rigs or something. And, um, yeah, so the thing with it was we had his Night Stalker army, which consisted of, like, three soul players, two hordes of scarecrows, two regiments of scarecrows, two hordes of butchers, the, the, the thing that gives out inspiring ones per round. I can't remember what the thing's called. I can't remember. I think it's the, the Void or something like that. I'm sorry. I don't know Night Stalker super well. Uh, he had the uh, Inshiren. Uh, character, um, and then like a couple of phantom, I think, troops. He had a pretty sweet looking list. In fact, I believe he got best painted army at the whole event. Uh, it was beautiful looking. Beautiful looking Night Stalker army. Absolutely gorgeous. Loved it. Loved playing against it. I was so glad that we got to have two really cool looking armies go up against each other uh, and have a good time. And the thing that was special about, so we didn't really bring it up in kill. I don't remember the exact bonus points that were, were brought up for the kill mission. Other than it was like kill more inspiring or something like that, it was something. It said something like to kill more characters or something like that. But since Brian and I had such a bloody game, those points either just ended up neutraling out because we both killed as much as the other, or something like that, right? So it didn't really come up. But in Paul and I's game, this was basically pillage, and again, this is with progressive scoring. So we would score based our, at the start of our turn or at the end of our turn, we would score. For what we controlled on each player's turn. Um, and we also both had to secretly pick one of the missions to be our key, like, target or whatever, right? Um, the way I remember the game going is that we, we had an instance where I sent my lone wolf down a flank of his that was pretty weak. He brought the ranger, uh, which the ranger is pretty good. Uh, oh, and he had three mind screeches. Duh. It's typical mind stalkers, right? Uh, so he had actually had a pretty good chunk of shooting. Because the three mind screeches and the ranger is a lot of firepower for a list that also can just do a ton of damage with melee. Because butchers and, and everything are also just really good. Um, so what he had was he had this uh, this flank that he had basically some phantoms. And then it was a bunch of just scarecrows and soul flares. And I was going to try to send my lone wolf into his, basically his side. And have it do a bunch of combo charges with the slave guardians. Um... The problem I ran into, and I ran into this quite a bit at the event, is I kept jamming myself up. So the lone wolf ran into the woods, got into a position where he could charge somebody. And then I had my scavengers charge a unit of his phantoms that were trying to babysit an objective. And then I ran a bunch of skeleton uh, spearmen up into his scarecrow hordes, and we just had a bunch of slap fights forever. Well, um, he ended up either body blocking me with soul flares or getting like, some some pockets of like I, I forget they have fly and they're high four and so he was able to land like in front of one of my slave guardians and stop it for a turn. He played very well, um, and uh, it was interesting. I ended up I can't remember, quite remember the score. But I do remember uh, most of my games were very close despite them being losses. Um, they felt they felt close anyways. But he ended up beating me um, with like a, a basically uh, basically jamming me up. He kept throwing important thing he threw he kept throwing things in front of my face into my important stuff and so like my enslaved guardians couldn't get into the fight when they needed to and i ended up winning like one of the flanks and he ended up winning one of the flanks um but i had a total turn basically where i didn't get to score um and that's enough in these kind of games where if, like if we stalemate the rest of the game well if you scored three points, for example, on one turn, and I scored only one, but then we score three every turn, I'm still going to have a two-point, you know, deficit at the end there. And that's just, that's basically what ended up happening. He played very smart and trying to just jam me up for one solid turn, and then 
after that, he just kept throwing stuff in my way to where he could still control the objectives on his side, but I couldn't get to his side to like kill the things that were holding the objectives. It was actually probably one of my favorite games of the weekend. I, I gave Paul my uh, best game vote, for sure, number one best game. He gave me a bunch of really cool... Uh, he, he actually had a really thematic army. It was a beautiful army. I should have got some pictures of just it, but I do have some pictures of the game. Uh, you might be able to see what I'm talking about when you look at those photos. But um, he had this, uh, his list. His list was in an envelope. It was like a seal and everything on this really old-looking paper. So it was all, like, spooky and mysterious-looking. So it was like I got an envelope from a an uh, a, a uncle that just died, and I need to go to his mansion, and it's haunted. Woo! Uh, and he also gave me a little goodie bag with, like, a bunch of candies that were, like, Halloween-themed candies with, like, eyeball, gummy eyeballs and stuff like that. And then a really cool dice with, like, a Cthulhu eye on it. It was very cool. Um, and Paul was just super fun to play against. Super fun guy. We didn't, nobody was being super sweaty or, or gamey or anything. He was just really fun to hang out with. Uh, and he actually ended up winning the drinking award, too. He, he drank a ton, apparently, uh, uh, each night after the, uh, after the games were over. And he was just an absolute blast. I loved hanging out with him. Um, getting to play a game with him it was an absolute privilege, and I hope that I get a chance to play against him again. And I, I I'm excited to see what he does with his next army, because his army was just gorgeous. Uh, he won painting, he won uh, the uh, uh, drinking award, and he beat me, so he won our game. <laughs> um, yeah, so that was Paul and I's game, and then game three, the last game of day one, was against Greg Persons, uh, who brought dwarves, uh, and we played a mission called. Poison the Well. Now, uh, I don't know what this mission is in the book that it's like referring to, like what it, what it, which one it's based off of. But it's there's three objectives, and we both pick one secretly to be poisoned. And I think starting turn five, the poisoned well gets revealed, and now that well is worth less points. So it's it's you get two points for you get two points each turn for starting turn three. For each well you control, and then the bonus points on this one were if you ever at one point controlled more wells than your opponent for the whole game. So basically, if you ended up, you know, holding two and your opponent only was ever to hold one, or if your opponent and you were both able to hold two, you needed to control all three at one point by the end of the game and not let your opponent. Um, and so it was an interesting game, but I. Uh, I don't get to play against dwarves a lot. I don't remember the last time I got to play against dwarves. But he brought a ton of shooting. Uh, that's what it felt like anyways. He brought like three of the long rifle guys, a couple of organ guns, and then these character monster units that like just happened to have like, you know, six shots on them or 12. Like one of them was basically an organ gun that could move, uh, which is like 12 shots. It was, it was a struggle. Uh, I was really not prepared for that. And I had a really good lead. And that was a lot of the games that I played. Is I had a really, really good lead. Um, I feel like every single game I lost, the reason they were so close is because I was winning turns like 3, 4, and 5. But then they would they would take over the bottom of 5, wipe out a bunch of my stuff, and then win out turns 5. I would score nothing like turn 6. Um, and then they would score it. And then if we ever got a 7, it would just put the nail in the coffin. And it, it was unfortunate, because that was kind of how the whole weekend felt. I feel like my army just couldn't last. And shooting seemed to be a really big problem. Uh, I mean, against two of my five games for sure, had I would say the Night Stalker list was a lot of shooting, or a good chunk of shooting. I don't want to say a lot of shooting, like elves. But enough shooting to be like, oh, man, this is really unfortunate. They're, they're going to kill a unit at, like every turn or two. And then same for, so Night Stalker's and the same for Dwarves. Because um, he also had, I think, throwing mad steps on like every one of his regiments as well. So it was just a bunch of just peppering me. And I know I have a heal and I have life leech and stuff, but like you can't be everywhere at once with your casters. Um, and so yeah, it just was a it was it was a little unfortunate to deal with uh, that much of firepower and not be prepared for it. Uh, and then the dwarves aren't like pushovers either. They're like defense five, defense six army, and I don't have a ton of crush crushing strength in my list. It's like. It's the Enslaved Guardians of the Mummies. So if they can get in front of my skeletons and then just sit there and fight my skeletons for this game, then nobody's going to... I get jammed up again. And that's kind of what happened. Is I felt like I just got jammed up, which was unfortunate. I, and I've been talking to Adam Ballard, who's a PTO of Bug Eater and a previous Masters winner. 
Um, he also brought EOD, and he did pretty well with them. I think he got six overall, something like that. Um, and, you know, it, uh, talking to him, he thinks it's my deployment, and I changed my deployment from Adepticon to something else, and then now I feel like it's, it's, it's still not working for me. I keep getting jammed up, and it's unfortunate to see that. But, um, it is what it is. So then game four, the second day, first game of the sec uh, second day, was against David Sweat, um, who's a, fr a friend of mine that I've known for a while. We've never actually got to play, I don't believe. Um, but I see him at almost all the tournaments I go to. He's a great guy. And he was playing Forces of Nature with, I think it was like three Water Elemental Hordes, three Greater Water Elementals, two Air Elemental Hordes, a Greater Air Elemental, uh, a Centurion, and then like some named character... Uh, air elemental guy, but he's like an individual air guy. Uh, and then he brought the ranger. And we played basically control. Um, the bonus points for this one were like if you ever control the middle across from you or, or your own home objective, or if you deny sorry, or if you if you don't have your opponent on your side of the table at all, um, you get another bonus points. So this game came down to some interesting choices, and I think I feel like I played this game well I just did not get uh, some some rolls and some stuff that I needed, but I feel like I played this game really well. Uh, I'm actually I feel like I could have probably won this game. So I had a spearman regiment. I threw way off to one flank, and it just basically ran up the board and controlled the point for me. It denied him getting the bonus points for stopping me from or stopping him from having none of me on his side. I was able to get a unit on his side of the board and control a point. And I just had, I mean, it was worth getting rid of that one skeleton failing squad to just camp there and, and chill and get me get me four points, because each, each zone was worth four, and stop him from scoring two. Um, and then what ended up happening is I had this really sweet play with my other side. So he tried to put the two air elemental hordes and the greater air elemental and the air elemental wizard guy on one flank, and I countered that with my lone wolf, Sevic Rai, the undead worm, and a uh, spear phalanx unit and I had all of that basically hiding behind the spear phalanx and we marched up the board and there was a forest separating all of this from the rest of the game like they're, they're, they couldn't get to the rest of my army very easily so I just marched the the my little block of dudes forward and we played a game of chicken and eventually I got to the point to where I flew my dragon into a squad flew my lone wolf into his greater air elemental and then I was able to surge the spearman into his other air elemental so I was able to get the charge off on all three of his units uh, and start that grind out and it, I mean I feel like I was supposed to win that flank um, and between some unfortunate uh, nerve rolls for me and some great ones for him I lost my dragon and then I lost my skeleton spears and I just had the lone wolf left and then the rest of his units just like reformed and looked at the lone wolf and just smashed it to pieces um, I also had scavengers charging at his lone ranger, so he couldn't shoot ever, uh, which was nice. And that was, I feel like I really did, I made some smart plays and they just weren't rewarded. Um, that was probably the only game that I felt like, okay, I know I'm doing the right call here and I'm not getting the reward of that. The other games, maybe it was, I could leave that for an experience, but I felt like I was doing everything I needed to in this game and didn't get it. Um, that's not to say that Dave didn't, didn't, David didn't play well. Dave did everything he needed to, and did, had some amazing, uh, just flank plays, and and those those tight or those air elementals are very hard to get around. The same with the water elementals, um, and uh, yeah, I don't know. There was also a, a turn there where I had a flank on a centurion that if I would have killed the centurion, I would have been able to basically reform and look at the flank of his whole army with an enslaved guardian horde, and I would I missed a um, like three inch surge with with the monolith. Um, and I was like, okay, sure. And then he blew that whole enslaved guardian horde to pieces because I was out of I was out of line. Like I was now out of uh, position. So very unfortunate. Uh, but I mean, you can't really control anything with that. So he ended up winning it. Um, he ended up getting one more zone than me. Um, he had his own zone. I had my own zone. I had one of the corner zones, and then he had two of the side zones. So it was a four to three, very close game. Um, and yeah, I just. I, my list, my list between some some roles, and then also he had heal and regen on like every single unit. It was very hard to try and and grind out against that kind of an army, and it did not work out for me. 
So game five, uh, I actually ended up having to play against one of my sons, Sons of Drew. Uh, I played against Noah, who has brought his salamanders, uh, and we played the Blizzard mission, which is invade, but again, you roll two, three, or four d6 each, add them together, and that's how far you get to see. So this game was interesting. Um, I ended up forcing, uh, anchoring my side to a side of the table, to dry and deny flanks, which Richard Comstock, a good friend of mine from Texas, who also plays EOD, told me to start doing day two. Um, and that's what I tried to start doing. Um, and I denied a flank with that by like basically using the side of the board as an anchor. Um, this game, uh, unfortunately, I my dice finally showed up because I rolled super hot this game. Um, I ended up charging a... Uh, so for deployment, let's start my deployment. I put the Lone Wolf and a Desert Swarm on the far left of the board. And I basically had the Lone Wolf, like, escort them to his side and stop any Ember Sprites from getting in the way or shooting it. Uh, and so I just ended up, I just threw it over there because I was like, this Desert Swarm is not going to do anything for me to block charges or whatever. I would rather just get that one extra unit strength point over the side. And then the Lone Wolf, after it got it over there and it hid behind a building, the Lone Wolf was able to get back into the game by, like, turn three and start charging stuff and doing his dread bubble and stuff. Well, because basically we played, we played chicken for the first two turns. But um, game, turn three, like, I had an enslaved guardian horde, charge a ceremonial guard horde with the lone wolf, and we killed him in one turn. And that was just the fall. That was the fall of the game. Like, that was just everything right there. And I ended up just going down the rest of his army and, he brought two ceremonial guards hordes, um, a tyrant horde, two fire elemental hordes, Rockwas, the pale rider, um, three ember sprites or four ember sprites, and then like a couple of heroes. And he started off really well with a, I accidentally gave him a flank to my scavengers he, with, it, with his ember sprites, and he took it, flanked them, killed them with like needing a 10 on the roll, but I wasn't an inspiring, and now he had these stupid ember sprites in my and I had to send, like, my undead worm in to kill the Ember Sprites. Um, and it just created a whole ruckus in my line I did not like. Um, but I ended up recovering from that by sending out my chaff into his line to try and block charges so the undead worm could kill the Ember Sprites and, and basically recover to stabilize. And then after I stabilized, winning that, that left-hand flank, my left-hand flank, by killing that ceremonial guard horde was huge. Because then it just put, a, it put an enslaved guardian horde in his side that he had to now turn and look at. But if he turns to look at it, he's got the rest of my army looking at him, plus surge shenanigans, and it was just brutal. Um, I ended up tabling him. Um, unfortunately, one of the bonuses for this was to uh, have no like inspiring units alive for your opponent. So I ended up, I, I, we, we ended up getting in the turn seven roll, and I ended up killing every single model he had. And it was brutal. Uh, it was a 20 0 victory for me. Um, and I felt horrible because he was one game away from like going 2 3. Um, that would have, we actually all pretty much went 1-4. His brother, Aaron, went one win, one tie, three losses. That was the best record for the Sons of Drew the whole weekend. It was rough. It was a very rough weekend. Um, but, yeah, and that, so that was, all, that was all my games. I ended up only winning the one, uh, and it had to be against one of my, my club mates. But, you know, that's okay. Um, I ended up, like, top of the bottom third uh, overall in the placements. Like, I think I, I can look at it real quick. So, I, yeah, I had... One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, nineteen, twenty-one, twenty-four, twenty-seven, thirty, thirty-three. 13, 14, 15, 19, 21, 24, 27, 30, 33. I was 34th. So out of 57, that's not horrible. There were 23 other people that did worse than me. So, uh, yeah, so I was in the middle then, I think, at that point, right? I was bottom in the middle. So... Uh, you know, and, and again, it's just the way it goes. You know, I, I, I didn't, if I, if I could have won one more game, I, uh, and got like 10 or 12 more points, I, I most definitely would have placed even higher. Because the only difference, because of paint and, and sports, I was like 10 points away from getting to like the top third. So, something like that. So, I, I just needed to win like one more game, I think. And I, I could have done a lot better. Um, still wouldn't have placed amazingly, but... You know, I would have placed a, a firm middle to up rather than a middle and lower. So, anyhow, overall, um, I had fun. 
Uh, it's it's hard for me to not have fun at this event. It's hard for me to not have fun at the Kings of War GPs to begin with, just because they're like a family reunion. You're going to see friends that you don't get to see every every uh, maybe once or twice a year. Have a good time, have good food, get to spend time with them, get to hear about their lives. Um, I think the biggest thing for me that sucked this year, and I want to make sure again because this is supposed to be an unbiased, um, just raw, uh, almost like review of the event. I want to make sure I'm very clear on this right now with what I'm about to say of what was not fun for me and what sucked for me has nothing to do with the actual event. This was a personal decision I made, um, and it impacted my fun. Uh, this is not something that uh, is wrong with the event. It's not anybody can control. It's something I did. So I am doing a weight loss challenge right now, and I mean, I've lost like 27 pounds. I'm loving it. I feel really good. Uh, and part of that challenge is I can't drink. Well, this is like the event I go to to get super drunk and have fun. I did not get to do that. So, it, yeah, it felt different. And it felt weird. And it didn't feel as fun. Because I didn't get to go be goofy and have fun and stuff and do, you know, crazy, crazy things. But that's my fault. And also, like, why do I need a drink to go have fun? There's a lot more to that, right? And so I think this really opened my eyes to that. It's like, okay, you know what? Like, and and by and for the for the fact of it, like, by the end of day one and especially day two, I was starting to have fun again because I talked to some people about it and they're like, well, hey man, let's just have a good time and have fun anyways, right? And it's like, okay, cool. But it is a little challenging to be with around a lot of people you normally are with and they're drunk and you're not getting to be. You're kind of like missing out on that, right? So. Anyways, the team seemed to really love it uh, for their first event. Uh, we also didn't come in last, so there were two teams that went. Uh, the Oklahoma City guys, who are originally OK Crew, but they went as the stepdads of Drew, thinking it would be funny, uh, and they, they lost to us. We thought we were going to get dead last, but we beat them out. We did better than they did. So good for Sons of Drew. We got there. Um, but everybody I've talked to, for the most part, had a good time just at least being with everybody. If they didn't even enjoy the games, they had a fun time being around the atmosphere and the, with the people. A lot of the guys are already building lists. They're already wanting to talk about going to Bug Eater. Um, they seem to have really enjoyed the game. And this is a this is really awesome because kind of going into this, then I thought Kings of War was kind of dying off a little bit here in my local scene. But And I don't think it's going to be as strong as it was when we started. Games rarely are. Uh, but I think it'll be something that, we, you know, we, we still want to go to events and do tournaments. And we'll, we'll start looking at, like, hey, you know what, let's, let's do, you know, a game or two a month and try to practice for a tournament kind of thing. So, and I'm really excited for that. I still love playing this game. Regardless of what's going on in my local scene, I'm still going to go compete and have a good time playing the game. Um, and I'm glad that now I've got other people that are feeling the same way. Uh, I do want to point out the winner uh, of the event was Jesse Garrett with his Force of the Abyss and Dustin Howard, who uh, tied Jesse um, overall with Ogres. Uh, and I don't know what the tiebreakers are. Um, I think it's battle. Yeah, looking at it, it looks like it's battle. So oh, out of 100 possible points, Jesse got 82 and Dustin got 79. And so they gave the overall to Jesse, which nothing wrong with that. I mean, that's totally normal. Like, there's a tiebreaker, right? Um, but the fact that both of them scored so well is just freaking awesome. Um, and I, I think that's I think that's fantastic that they they both. I know both of them personally. They're both great great guys and great players. Um, and they they deserve it. Both of them deserve that that high of placing. So um, with that. Congrats to everybody and how they did. Uh, I don't remember all the, the awards that were won. They do like three awards for every category, which is cool. Um, I don't remember all the awards, but those were the highlights of the weekend for me. Overall, I'd say pretty good time. Not the best Lone Wolf I've had, but still Lone Wolf, and Lone Wolf is always fun. I'm excited for next year's already. Uh, I've got an army in mind that I kind of want to start working on. Paul Welsh has really inspired me with his paint to try and step it up and do some cool new things. Uh, and then I'm looking forward to Bug Eater with my Empire Dust Army. So we'll just kind of see how things go. And I'll be sure to talk to you guys about that at the next review. Have a good one. Bye-bye.